U.S. military is trying to reorganize itself. For the last 20 years, it's been waging these small wars across the developing world. And what they were trying to do overall was encircle and contain peer and near peer competitors like Russia and China, actually Russia and China specifically. And they have more or less failed in that pursuit. And now they're trying to reconfigure their military so that they can more directly fight Russia and China. And they're doing it through a concept known as multi-domain operations. And uh, if we take a look at the paper that was trying to lay all of this out, it's a 2018 paper, the US Army in Multi-Domain Operations 2028. They actually show you the, the multiple domains that they're talking about, space, cyberspace and information space, uh, airspace, across land and at sea. And they're going to do this through the creation, at least partly through the creation of multi-domain task force. And those look like this. So you have the multi-domain task force broken down into intelligence, information, cyber electronic warfare and space battalion. You also have strategic fires battalion, which include HIMARS battery, a HIMARS battery, which these are, are rockets, mid-range capability battery. These would be mid-range missiles and long-range hypersonic weapon battery that uh, is, you know, self-explanatory. They also have air defense and brigade support battalion, which includes everything else military forces need while they're out there, uh, out in the field. And what all of this is trying to do is overcome Russia and China's anti-access area denial systems, things like air defense systems and long range fires that Russia and China have for a long time excelled in. The U.S. has been kind of behind in. Now they're trying to close that gap through the creation of these multi-domain task force. And just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, this is from CSIS a Missile Defense Project. This CSIS is a think tank funded by the U.S. government and the U.S. arms industry. And they admit that Russia now possesses some of the most advanced air and missile defense systems in the world. And that's because they focused on that while the West was more focused on air superiority capabilities, fighter aircraft, essentially. And Russia was focused on defending against those aircraft, preventing them from entering their airspace. So the U.S. is trying to close that disparity by creating the multi-domain task force that would use long-range hypersonic missiles to take out its air defenses so that the U.S. could move with freedom anywhere it wanted to, like, for example, in Syria and finish their regime change operation there or defeat Russia in places like Ukraine. All of this, though, uh, that I'm talking about is not just to introduce this idea to you, but also to explain that um, these multi-domains that the U U.S. military is trying to consolidate a doctrine around, that is a limited list of domains. U.S. wages war constantly. Uh, in, in this paper, it actually separates warfare into a competition stage and a conflict stage. And the U.S. military is supposed to be operating across both stages. And if you really think about it, the U.S. is constantly at war with absolutely everyone on Earth. They seek their, their national goal is global primacy. They want primacy over the entire globe. And in order to do that, you need to constantly fight with absolutely everyone on Earth. It is a modern day empire, and that is what an empire does. It fights with everyone until everyone is subordinated to it. They do not just do this uh, during declared war. Obviously, they do it through covert actions. They also do it through proxy wars. The war in Ukraine right now is a proxy war the U.S. is waging against Russia, there's multiple proxy wars the U.S. is waging against Russia and China. Syria is another proxy war. The U.S. military, uh, they're focused on space, cyberspace, air, land, and sea. But then there's also political space. There's information space. And the U.S. is waging war across these domains as well. And they're doing it not through the military, not yet. It hasn't been integrated into the military yet. But they use organizations like, say, the National Endowment for Democracy. And I've shown many times how the National Endowment for Democracy is used to shape a society and, and turn the population against itself, to 
to, to weaponize a segment of the population and do to that country what the U.S. would love to do with its military, but just at the moment couldn't. I, I'll show you Myanmar, also referred to as Burma, its British colonial name. Uh, I'm going to show you how the U.S. has been doing this in Myanmar and how it is essentially a proxy war against China. So let's start with the National Endowment for Democracy's website. And let's look at this long, long list, scores and scores of programs. The list will be in the video description. Uh, just click on it and look through these programs. And you're going to see that they are interfering in virtually every aspect of Myanmar's socio-political landscape from elections to information to the media to legal system education absolutely everything is being interfered in by the u.s government through the national endowment for democracy they are dividing people they are radicalizing people and they are unleashing them and, and giving them the resources they need to fight against their own government and against people who support that government they did this during the so-called Arab Spring in 2011. It was the National Endowment for Democracy that for years ahead of the so-called Arab Spring were preparing opposition groups to overthrow their respective governments. And then once they did, the U.S. introduced armed groups as well, and they were waging these proxy wars. Libya was a proxy war until the U.S. intervened directly, and Syria was a, a proxy war that the U.S. eventually ended up uh, interfering in directly uh, and is now occupying territory in eastern Syria. Yemen is a proxy war. And I just referred to Ukraine as a proxy war. Well, in Myanmar, they have, uh, since the coup in February last year, 2021, there was this, there were these violent protests which turned into armed fighting, just like the Arab Spring in 2011. And uh, these armed groups are, are getting weapons from these armed ethnic groups that the U.S. and the British have been supporting since Myanmar got its independence in 1948. They're pr private armies in Myanmar fighting against the central government, and they're helping channel arms and training into the, the so-called People's Defense Force, who's trying to wrest control of the country from the central government. And it's because the U.S., just like it did in Iraq in 2003, they're trying to uh, execute a regime change operation here, only they don't want to use or they cannot use their military directly. They're using the People's Defense Forces as their proxies, and uh, they'll do things like this. So they're attacking infrastructure. This is an attack on the, the train, the rail network. And uh, one of the terrorists, Le Pierre One, he says, anyone in uniform who continues to work for the junta, including traffic, police, firefighters, and even Red Cross workers is fair game. And this is what the U.S. would do in an actual war. If it was waging a, a regime change war against Myanmar, that's who they would be bombing and killing. Absolutely everyone working for the government. Another thing that they would do is attack the communication infrastructure. That would, would be one of the first things the U.S. would knock out with its warplanes and, and cruise missiles. But they're not, they can't do that. And they're not doing that in Myanmar, but that's okay because they have these terrorists doing it for them. So uh, this is from Reuters. Attacks on Myanmar telecom towers show evolving tactics in conflict. And it says around 700,000 people in Myanmar are estimated to have lost internet access after attacks on telecommunication equipment run by Mitel, the partly army controlled company said amid reports that dozens of its towers were damaged. The explosions have occurred since the national unity government, this is the fake parallel government the US wants back in power, a shadow administration formed to resist the army's February 1st coup declared last week a people's defensive war against the junta. But what it is in reality is a proxy war the U.S. is waging through these armed militants. These people are burning their own country down, dividing and destroying it. Uh, it's not going to benefit them in any conceivable way, just like it didn't benefit the people in Libya or Syria or Yemen. But it does benefit the U.S. who seeks to destroy these countries because of why? Because they are partners, close partners, with U the United States' adversaries, peer and near-peer competitors, Russia and China. Myanmar is a very close partner with China, which is why amid this proxy war, the U.S. is also encouraging these militants to do what? To do things like this. 
Attacks on Chinese-run factories in Myanmar vex Beijing. Attacks on Chinese-run factories in Myanmar's biggest city drew demands Monday from Beijing for protection for their property and employees, while many in Myanmar expressed outrage over China's apparent lack of concern for those killed in protests against last month's military coup, which is, which is a lie. These protesters, these political groups that the U.S. is cultivating in Myanmar are by design anti-China. That's baked into the process. Same here in Thailand and same in Hong Kong and in Xinjiang. All of these separatist and anti-Chinese groups across the entire region, they're all funded by the National Endowment for Democracy and the entire point is to encircle and contain China. And what the U.S. is doing is waging war against China by attacking its uh, allies and also by attacking Chinese infrastructure inside these countries as part of investments and as part of the Belt and Road Initiative that China is using to try to network the entire region and lift the entire region up with it. This was going on in Pakistan as well. Just, just to show you that the U.S. is already waging war against China. They're just doing it indirectly. And they're doing it across these different domains that the U.S. has over the years perfected. Uh, the military is trying to consolidate this idea in their own doctrine, but the U.S. has been doing this uh, through the military and through non-military means, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, for example, and the CIA and their support for these covert armed organizations. So in uh, southern Pakistan, Balochistan, uh, you have these separatists, and this is what they do. Suicide blast in southern Pakistan kills three Chinese driver. And these are usually uh, engineers, but also teachers, anyone from China that's working in Pakistan as part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is a component of the much larger Belt and Road Initiative. So instead of the U.S. just going in there and bombing it because they want it stopped, they are backing these armed militants to do it for them. And you even had things like this. This was from 2012. This was a, a bill that went through Congress expressing the sense of Congress that the people of Balochistan have the right to self-determination into their own sovereign country. And the reasoning behind this is explained here in this uh, op-ed in 2011, Free Balochistan. And it says to counter Islamism in nuclear Pakistan, the United States should do more to su support Baluch insurgents, which makes no sense when you think about it. It's a nuclear armed country and you want to carve it up. Why would you do that? That Wouldn't that destabilize the country and potentially have those nuclear arms fall into the wrong hands? Uh, but that, that was just an excuse. That, it didn't make sense because it was just an excuse. The real reason they wanted to do this is stated all the way here in the last paragraph. Pakistan has given China a base, Ecuador, in the heart of Baluch territory. So an independent Baluchistan would serve U.S. strategic interest. And there should be a period there. But they decided to try to couch it behind this excuse that they're using to support these separatists. And again, it was an indirect way of waging war against China and its allies, attacking Chinese infrastructure without doing it directly. It's a multi-domain operation carried across the, the National Endowment for Democracy, which in Pakistan supports Baluch independence in Southwest Pakistan. So what I want to do is not just introduce you to this concept of multi-domain operations that the U.S. military itself specifically is trying to consolidate and introduce to their, their operations, both in competition time and conflict time. Uh, I want to show you that the U.S. is already waging multi-domain warfare, and they're doing it through direct and indirect means. When you understand that the U.S. is waging full-spectrum war against the entire planet because it is an empire, Nations need to start thinking about full-spectrum defense. It is not just about soldiers and tanks and warplanes war and ships. You also need to protect your political space, your information space. None of these can be left open for the U.S. to attack. The U.S. is openly attacking across all of these domains. You need to protect yourself across all of these domains. A nation today in the 21st century that does not have its own social media platforms and allows the U.S. to dominate their information space is a nation that is not protecting itself. It is leaving itself wide open. It is the same as a nation that has no standing army, essentially. You are allowing the U.S. to come into your information space 
weaponizing the people in your country against you. You could have a thousand tanks, but if you have no one that's going to get into them and point the turret in the right direction, what good are they? The point of this is to explain that there is this concept of multi-domain operations. It is much larger than just the U.S. military. Nations need to start protecting themselves against it. And then just one more thing I want to show you is this video. This is uh, U.S. Congress uh, representative John Gallagher from Wisconsin. He's asking the U.S. military, where can we stick one of these multi-domain task forces so that we can uh, attack China? Listen to this video. So if we were interested in denying the PLA a lodgment on Taiwan, uh, do you at present have the basing access or agreements with allies necessary to deploy a multi-domain operation task force and employ those long-range fires either to sink, sink PLA Navy ships or sink aircraft or helicopters that are trying to land PLA soldiers on the Taiwan mainland? Well, as far as agreements, there's, there's discussions, and that's a policy question. Uh, what, what, at least from where I'm sitting, is, is providing those type of requirements. I could talk about other places where we didn't think we'd have that capability we did not have in place, but as the situation has developed, we're seeing changes. And again, from where I see as the, the chief staff of the Army is, I'm providing options to the combatant commander. And then I defer to uh, the policymakers on, you know, where we can get access. But, but the, the other thing, too, is as far as expeditionary fires, those, yeah, those they systems... Where they're going to be, right, uh, to make sure they're in range of... Well, that's right. Right. So, I... I Yes or no? I, I'd be, Are, I know you're I'd not be in glad the State this Department negotiating such agreements, but clearly you have a view on whether we are where we need to be to deploy multi-domain operation tasks. With respect to everything happening in Ukraine right now, I got it. Uh, at least in Indo-PACOM, this has to be our top diplomatic priority. If we're going to talk about integrated deterrence, and I've been a critic of integrated deterrence, full disclosure, what we should integrate is the State Department doing moving heaven and earth to negotiate basing agreements with key allies so that we can deploy teams of Marines or soldiers in order to deny a PLA invasion of Taiwan. So one part of the U.S. Uh, creating havoc all across Southeast Asia, for example, in Myanmar, uh, the protests here in Thailand, yes, it is to so turn the people against China and attack Chinese infrastructure, Chinese investments directly, but it's also to try to shape the region so that the U.S. can move its own military assets like the multi-domain task force into the region in range so that they can do things like wage direct war against China as well. Right now, the U.S. cannot reach China with its multi-domain task forces because U.S. territory is nowhere near Taiwan, which means whatever China is doing to Taiwan has, has nothing to do with defending the U.S. It is the U.S. defending its hegemony in the region. The U.S. officially recognizes Taiwan is part of China. So this isn't even a matter of protecting an ally country. The U.S. doesn't recognize Taiwan as a country. They recognize it as part of China. So this is the U.S. interfering in China's internal political affairs and trying to shape the region so that it can put its military right there to directly confront China, in addition to the years and years of it indirectly attacking China, and by the way, killing Chinese citizens in the process. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. If you're watching this on YouTube, please check the video description below so you can see where else you can find my work, like on Odyssey, Rumble, and Telegram, just in case YouTube decides to delete my channel someday. Uh, also in the video description below, you'll find all of the links that I referenced as well as for ways you can help support my work. And you could do that through Buy Me A Coffee, through Patreon, and through PayPal. To everyone who has been helping, whether it's month to month, through one-time donations, or even if you're just helping share my work, or sending kind words and news tips, I appreciate all of that help. It's all greatly appreciated. I couldn't do this without that help. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.